Hi, and welcome to The Hero Spouse. I'm Kendra Ruth, here to answer one of your questions about marriage and midlife crisis. Today we have an anonymous female left behind spouse. Her bomb drop was July of 2021, and date of marriage is 2006. She has an off and on who is a low energy wallower. She says, I can't understand the abrupt end to 20 years and the continuing lies. I asked him to leave in January. I used your frat boy and frat house analogy. Night after night, he would just leave, pulling cash out so he couldn't be traced. A year after bomb drop, he continues to lie. He refuses to say he's had a physical affair with his personal assistant. I'm confused why her boyfriend would stand for such a relationship between his girlfriend and her boss. I'm beginning to wonder if my husband is gay. The partying has decreased, an abrupt stop the minute he moved out. I asked him if he was not being intimate with her, nor this, with, with, oh, not being intimate with me, nor this personal assistant. He spent many an hour with her. Then, who was he sleeping with? He blurted, maybe I am gay. I have since asked if that is the case. And he, of course, says no. The hurt cuts so deep. He brushes off my hurt like I'm nothing. I'm only, he's only concerned about the welfare of our son. Things aren't adding up. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting that. Why is this all on me? I've reached my limits and I know I have to detach, but why is there so much blame on me? Okay, so first let's talk about that blame really quickly. Why is there so much blame on you? Because it's easier for him. If it's your fault, then he doesn't have to face it. There's nothing for him to fix. He can just go off on his own way and not worry about the solution because it's not his to find and it's not his to create. It's not his to fix. It's easier. If it is his fault, if it is something about him, then he has to look deeper in. And midlife crisis, he's an escape and avoid. It is a crisis of avoidance. And the thing he's avoiding is why it's him, what it is about him. That feeling of responsibility, blame, what am I doing? What's wrong with me? Who am I? All of these things. And oftentimes that can sneak up on us, but sometimes it comes very quick that the crisis can start very quickly with a trigger and they just fall down a rabbit hole. Because you're saying the abrupt end to 20 years. It can be abrupt. Now about the gay thing, I don't know, but oftentimes they just throw something out. And I think this is what my feeling on this is, is he threw it out there because it was convenient. I mean, you asked, so you, you planted the seed and he's like, yeah, whatever, maybe I am. That's how my husband Chuck said, what he said about midlife crisis. I think he said the words first, but then it's maybe I have a midlife crisis. So he didn't say it because I prompted him, but it was thrown out in a way to dismiss it so that he thought I'll send her off on that track and I'll get her off my back by doing it. He didn't really know what, what doing it, saying I have a midlife crisis meant it probably got, you know, more, uh, you know, on his back type of thing. But it, it didn't work. So he's just trying to deflect you. And, it, and the thing is, let's say, if he is gay, then what? If he's gay or he wants to, what, what do you call, if he wants to, if he's transgender, well, what do you say then? And I'm like, well, there's nothing I can do. If they're bisexual, maybe that's something to work with. But if they're gay, I'm holding them back. It's not, there's, there's no solution. I'm just going to keep somebody hostage in this life that they shouldn't be leading, pretending to be something they're not, even though it's painful for me. So it's easy to say I'm gay because you can't solve that one. You don't get out of it. Okay. So he did that just to get you off his back and, and then he denied it. So what about the girl, the, the possible alienator, the personal assistant? Why would the boyfriend her boyfriend allow this. Well, first thing, you didn't talk about whether they know or not. So could it be that they're they're having a, an affair and he doesn't know? Could it be they're young enough that they have an open relationship? Could it be that they're in the same situation you are in the sense of 
he doesn't know what to do about it either. So there are so many reasons, but some of it could be he doesn't know. Night after night, he'd leave. He would pull out the cash, so it seemed like he was partying. You're saying frat boy lifestyle, but is the what is it that is the frat boy lifestyle other than he took money and he was out late? Was the rest of it that it was partying an assumption, or could it be other things that are being hidden? Because you said things aren't adding up, and that he apparently was able to stop this frat boy lifestyle abruptly upon moving out. I've seen something similar, um, probably probably regularly, but I have a friend and she left her husband. This is 20 some years ago. She left him and she said he was a heavy drinker. And I don't know if she thought he was an alcoholic or not, but one of the, one of her complaints was the drinking. She says he stopped abruptly when she moved out and he was begging and pleading and wanting her back. And one of the things she said to me back at that time is that there's two ways to read that when they do it. I was so horrible to live with that he had to drink. Or the other way is why couldn't they have done it for me? Why couldn't they have done it sooner? Well, first thing they are doing it for you. And it wasn't that they're so horrible. They are a heavy drinker. We don't often do what we need to do when we're told. We get warnings. Our spouse is like, you know, it's getting close. I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave. But we don't believe it until it happens. And it happens. And then we think too little too late. Sometimes that's what it takes to get that person to do what they need to do. So I don't know what's going on. Is it some, is it, it might not be a partying thing. I can't tell. And I can't tell about with the girlfriend or not because you, you might not have more information. There is something, some form of alienating force. And yes, it might be this personal assistant. Or maybe the personal assistant is, maybe it's an emotional affair. Maybe it's an emotional, but they're not, but, but it's platonic. Will and grace. You know, they're, they're, they could, but it's still, they're confiding in each other which makes it an affair that is they're taking what they should be confiding in their spouse and, and giving it to somebody else. But there's never any sexual tension, sexual energy between them. It's still an alienating force in that. But maybe that's why the boyfriend. And I'm just throwing out random speculations here to figure it out. Because we don't know what. Maybe he is or isn't sleeping with anyone. And I, if you feel that there's really an affair, that this is an affair. When I say affair, I mean physical or that it is meant to be physical, it has that emotional tie to it, even if they haven't gone that far yet, I would trust your gut, really. That's, you know, unless you have been paranoid and maybe a history of paranoia and feel like you are. But that's scary because we feel paranoid during midlife crisis when all this has happened. If he's having a midlife crisis, it's gonna happen off, it'll often happen abruptly. There's often a trigger Often that would be uh, parent dies. But sometimes we can't find the trigger. Sometimes it's something that they keep secret from us. Sometimes it's a hidden trigger that, that we're not aware that that was the incident that had the impact on us. And so they might not even talk about it. Or we talked about it, but we just didn't realize that was it. But things can happen very quickly from the point of trigger. Because you have this cascade of thoughts now. So I'm going to give a brief example. A couple years ago, I was with, I took my kids and we went and stayed with my mom for a couple days. We were visiting because there was a family reunion. And the last day I was getting ready to leave and I wanted to go over to the store, get some ice and some stuff to fill our cooler because we had a long drive home. And my mom said, okay, I'll watch the kids, but can you take Elijah with you? Elijah was two and Elijah, five kids are a handful, but Elijah's a handful. Now, then, always. And I said, yeah, I had planned that. I was going to leave you only. I wasn't going to leave you with Elijah. So I packed Elijah in the car and off we went. I got to the, the grocery store and this was July. It was morning, not too hot, but 
it was going to be a hot day. Went in, grabbed, I think I only made it into two items, grabbed the ice. And as I was walking out in my basket, I was like, oh my God, Elijah. I had forgotten him in the car. I freaked out. I dropped, I, I, I left the basket in the middle of the parking lot and ran with my ice to Elijah, who was sleeping in the back and had no idea. If he hadn't been uh, fallen asleep, he would have said something as I was getting out originally. But I was shaking. I was first all those terrible stories and I'm a bad mother and I couldn't stop shaking. And now there are these cascading thoughts going through my head. I could have let that cascade keep going. Imagine that. And I never told Chuck about this. I told my mom about it when I got back, how scared I was. She could see I was scared because I was shaking. But now imagine that incident. You don't tell your spouse, you hide it because now you're afraid of being, you're afraid you're a terrible parent. And the cascading thoughts don't stop. And they don't stop. And they don't stop. As I was running through that in my head on the drive home, I realized just that can be a trigger for somebody to send them into a crisis because all of the self-doubt that can come up with it and the fears that can come up with it. Elijah was adopted by then, but I'm, I was a foster parent. There's these additional fears we have as a foster parent that they're always going to come and take our kids because they're always coming and checking the house and something's going to be wrong. You didn't have the right lock on your medicine cabinet. You have to have your ointments separated from a, in a different lock box from your regular stuff and you did it wrong. And oh my God, you're, they're going to take away your kids. It's, it's ever present fear, even if it's a paranoid fear. And so I could have let that just cascade and cascade. And I was thinking about how many people is that the trigger for? So the point being, we don't know. You might not know what your trigger is, but it can be abrupt. And I could have come home a changed person. And poor Chuck wouldn't have known what was going on. What just happened? Where'd my wife go? And why? Because he would have no idea. Even if I told him about the incident, he probably wouldn't recognize that relevance, the, the high level of it. And that might be something. There could be something that we just aren't aware of. He might not even be aware of it. I could let I could have suppressed and let it fester in there and still bother me and not be aware that that was a trigger. So that's why we have things that happen abruptly. And you think that all of your foundation of your life together is enough. And it's not because it brings family of origin into this. All of the suppressions and repressions from any trauma in the past and any self-doubt, and it brings up more self-doubt. And they're just going to cascade that around with their thoughts and thoughts and thoughts and how terrible they are or how much better they could have it, this life. Maybe they met an old girlfriend at the grocery store and they're not going after her because she was there and she was there with her kids and husband and they looked so happy and she was so beautiful and that just brought cascades of thoughts. And then he got home and he saw you and maybe you were in a bad mood. And that cascades of thoughts. But neither of you realizes that was a trick, that sort of thing. And then he's going to process over those thoughts for a few weeks. And then he bomb drops and changes everything. It can be abrupt like that. So if you're confused by it and you haven't taken the course, take Understanding the Life Crisis. Because that will can help with getting some of those answers about what is going on. Because I don't have a lot of answers for the specifics of this alienator, what's going on with it. Why is he being, not being intimate with her, with you? And is he with her? Is he gay? But I want you to go look at that course. I want you to understand the mindset that's in midlife crisis. And I want you to figure out how to detach because that is your biggest next step. Like you say, I know I must detach. Yes, you've got to detach. So understanding midlife crisis is not, not meant to be something you dwell on. That course is meant to be a short course because I want you to get the basic information. Then I want you to move on towards your healing. So not thinking about, I wonder if he's gay and psyching and cascading that through your head. Oh, why is the boyfriend not caring and cascading that through your head? Those thoughts are going to be repetitive going through you. I want you to get something to stop the rep repetitiveness of those thoughts so you can get to healing and they detach it. Okay. I'm sorry, everybody, that you are all going through this. And I will see everyone in the next question.